probation officer. Okay, this meeting's being reported <laughs> to staff uh, in facilities, to young people uh, around the world. And so uh, I'm gonna continue and not leave meeting. Um, and so it, it's a process that I've, I started as a teaching artist, I don't know how many lifetimes ago, and this was one of the foundational tools as an artist that I used to really engage with my students in those first meetings. As I navigated and transitioned into being a youth advocate and then an administrator in youth organizations on the state and national level, I realized that these same very simple tools allowed us a, a, a snapshot of the young people I was working with that was very different than sitting down with a pad of paper and starting to ask intrusive questions to young people about their lives. We give them a chance to participate and engage more holistically through this. And so that's where this originated from, and I've used it for almost 30 years now. Uh, but I'm gonna lead you through the process. The, the bio poem is 11 lines long, no rhyme, no verse, no meter, no iambic pentameter, none of those things that, that frightened me about poetry when I was young. And so it really is a poem about you. Any question that I put up here is gonna be something you ought to be able to answer and only you can answer in the way that should be answered. So 11 lines long. Line number one, I just want you to write your first name. I'm gonna ease us into it. This should be the easy one. <laughs> and I'll give you just a second. And it, it may be that you feel rushed as I move through these because I move quickly at times. And if you do feel that, type into the chat and, and someone can let me know to slow down uh, just a little bit because I get anxious and get excited about getting to the end sometimes. On line number two, I want you to write down four relationships you value, four important relationships to you, however you define that. They can be best friend of so-and-so or teammate of such-and-such -such or auntie or nephew, however you define four important relationships in your life. give you a few more seconds and again it might seem a little rushed and part of that is that I want you to write down the first thing that comes to mind not the best answer that comes to mind you know what I mean sometimes we're like well what's the right answer and the right answer is the first thing that pops in your mind because I think that's usually the most authentic a few more seconds on line number two And you can always leave a little space if you don't get everything. And these will, these will populate and stay on the screen as we go. So you can go back and fill in as we get to the end, okay? So I'm gonna leave it so we can continue to fill. Line number three, I would like you to write down three words that you think other people would use to describe you. Three words you think others would use to describe you. Three words you think others would use to describe you. Give you a few more seconds. Three words you think others would use to describe you. And remember, I'll do, leave some time, we can go back, and these will always be up here. On line number four, on line four, please write down three things that you fear or that you used to fear. And so while you're writing this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I put a caveat in. The, the question that comes up in everybody's mind, we do think, are we gonna have to share out loud? And so first, you don't. And even if you choose to share parts of this, you don't have to share any parts that you don't feel you wanna share with anyone but yourself, because really is about your personal reflection on this, but there'll be space at the end for any who'd like to share what they've written to share that, but there's no pressure, no expectation of sharing. This is about you. So line four is three things that you fear or used to fear. I'll give you a few more seconds. Three things you fear or used to fear. Line number five. On line five, 
please write down three things that you do not believe or do not believe in. Three things you don't believe, or three things you don't believe in, however you describe that and, and define that. Three things you do not believe or do not believe in. Three things you do not believe or do not believe in. And how's pacing? Everybody okay with pacing? Am I, am I keeping it? Not messing anybody? All right, looks like we're good. If I start going too fast, just drop a note in the chat and somebody will let me know. Thank you. We're gonna move on to line number six now. On line six, I'd like you to write down four things that you do believe or do believe in. Four things you believe or believe in. Four things you believe or believe in. Four things you believe or believe in. Well, we're doing great. I'll give you a few more seconds on line number six. Okay, I'm gonna move to line number seven. On line number seven, I want you to write down three hopes or dreams that you carry in the world. Three hopes or dreams that you carry. They can be universal, like world peace. Or they can be very personal. Like I hope we get that pizza with pepperoni for dinner tonight, you know. Four hopes or dreams you carry. I'm sorry, three hopes or dreams. You can write four if you want, no limits. I actually had a student ask me once, can I write six? I was like, yes, you can write six. Please, as, as much as you want. We deserve dreams and we have a right to have hope. I'll give you a few more seconds on hopes and dreams. That would usually take some energy to start putting in the, in the words. Just a couple more seconds on line seven. All right, line number eight. On line eight, please write down four words that you would use to describe yourself. Now remember up in line three, we wrote down words we think other people use on us. But this is about you now. What do you use to describe yourself? What are the words you use to describe yourself? Four words you use to describe yourself. Four words you would use to describe yourself. Four words you would use to describe yourself. I'll give you a few more seconds. Looks like you're doing great. Line nine, this is probably my favorite line. I, I just love saying line nine. Now, I've been doing this for 30 years and I still, that's my favorite sentence to say. Line nine, I don't know why, don't ask me. On line nine, please write down 
three things you would like others to be able to say about you when you're gone? This is our legacy question. Three things you would like others to be able to say about you when you're gone. Three things you would like others to be able to say about you when you're gone. Three things you would like others to be able to say about you when you're gone. Three things. I'll give you a few more seconds. Three things you'd like others to be able to say about you when you're gone. We're gonna to move to line 10. On line number 10, you get two choices. You can either write citizen of, or you can write resident of, then I want you to fill in the blank. Citizen of blank or resident of blank. Choose one of those. Citizen of blank or resident of blank. Citizen of or resident of blank. Give you a few more seconds on that. We only have one line left. Anybody want to guess what the last line is? The last line is. I see the hands. She, she had it right. You were going to say that. Last name. Line 11 is just your last name. So it's kind of like a you sandwich. This is all you. So here are all the prompts. I'm going to take just a few seconds, let you look over all of them to make sure that you've got the answers that you want in, in them. And like I said, um, your answers are your answers. I've had students say, well, I've got lots to put in. That's great. And some say, I've only got one or two. Well, that's a good start. We, we, we start where we are. And sometimes that's, that just starting and putting it down on paper gives you a chance to think about what other ways you might look at the question and answer it. And so now I'm going to do that thing that we sometimes do and see if there's anyone who would like to, to share what they wrote. And again, before we, I don't want you to feel any pressure there's, there's sometimes people wanna share. And if you do, I wanna make space for that. Um, I don't know how to raise hands on these things or, but if you put something in the chat, uh, I think Martha's probably watching that. Uh, and if not, we'll move on because I, I will, I'll share why I had you do the poem and we'll talk some more. Anyone? Um, I okay. will. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so for, um, oh, should I read the whole thing? Yeah, you can read the whole thing. Okay, so 
Um, oh, so Amelia, um, sister, my program manager, my mom's, my uncle, um, brave, determined, and strong. Um, push balls, grass, death, um, discrimination. Uh, um, we have rights. I want to meet Demi Lovato, have kids, be famous. Um, I'm funny, caring, dedicated, and independent. Um, she was inspiring, had a good heart, um, and determined, and citizen of Shawa and Harris. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amelia. That was great. Thank you. That was wonderful. Would anybody else like to share? And I always say, see, her ears didn't bleed, her eyes didn't explode, right? It, it, it didn't hurt much, did it, Amelia? No. Yeah, and thank you so much for modeling that. And it's okay if no one wants to share, no one else wants to share. Thank you for your courage, Amelia. What I will do is I will share one that I wrote. I started writing these when I was really young and they were very different. This one I wrote just a few years ago. And so now it, it reflects me as an adult, which I think, I hope means that I've grown. Um, but I'll, I'll share one that I wrote a, a few years ago. Hassan, father of sons, champion of children, and I fight injustice. Others call me a leader, a dreamer, or a fool. What I fear most are hopelessness, hatred, and losing more children to both. I do not believe that God only loves some, that might makes right, or that the early bird always catches the worm. But I do believe that enemies can be made friends, that tomorrow will be better if we act today, and that all children can learn. I dream of more schools and fewer prisons because we've made a need. I think that I am scared but courageous foolishly hopeful and stubborn enough not to change. When I'm gone, I hope someone can say of me, he gave me hope, he never gave up. Can you believe he said that to the president? I am a resident of the world I dream for my children, Davis. And so the bio poem is, and the, the structure of the bio poem can change. There are lots of variations and different things that you can put in. The reason I chose these prompts, the ones that we used, is because they give us uh, a pretty immediate snapshot of things that I think are important to reflect on as we start thinking about how we strengthen our own voice, how we advocate for ourselves, uh, and how we show up in the world. Uh, the questions about fears and beliefs and disbeliefs, uh, these, these are the real parts of us. And sometimes it's the parts of us that we keep so quiet that we don't even hear them. And if we can't surface the fears, if we can't bring to the top of our head uh, some of the challenges that we internally have, then we can't really face them and, and, and conquer them. And sometimes part of what we do to survive is we just press all of those things down and we ignore them. And I know that because that's how I lived most of my early life and until it got to a point where it almost exploded inside of me. And so this, this tool became very useful for me because I could finally put those things out and when I could look at them, then I felt I had more power to do something about it. Just because I have fear, just because there are things that uh, challenge me, once I can see them and I can see my fears right next to my hopes, and then I know I have something to work for, right? When I have those powerful words, I love those words that Amelia used for herself, right? When I have those powerful words, they remind me that I'm stronger than my fears. And when I have uh, the things that I want to be remembered for when I leave, I have a goal, right? And so all of this frames us being able to start setting goals for ourselves. It actually gives us place points to hold ourselves as we start thinking about how we show up in the world and move forward. So now that we've, we've looked at that, I want to talk, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we had two people raise their hand. The first one is Julia. Yes. Um, and I'll unmute you, Julia. 
Okay, good. Can you go ahead, Julia? All right. Hi, Hassan. I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. How can you uh, talk to your parents? My parents are supportive, but I feel like they like to hold on. How can you express or get your parent to listen? If I feel like they're afraid for me to move away from them. Mm. And how to get them to listen, hey, I'm able to move away. You just have to let me go. That's a great question, Julian. I, I probably don't have a solid 100% answer. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, one of the things that, and I'll tell you something that's really been interesting. This exercise we just did, the bio poem, I actually did a workshop once where I had parents do the bio poem, but not thinking about themselves, but thinking about their, their, their children. And so having them write down the things that they thought their children were, were you know, believed in or were afraid of or were struggling with or hopes and dreams. And then it gave them a chance to have something to go back and talk together about, right? So if you have your bio poem and you in, introduce, invite your parents to go through the same process, and we'll, we'll, I can make sure that you get a copy of these slides if you want, but if you take them through the same process and then you can sit down and talk about where their perceptions of you and where you are are different from your perception of you. And that might be a great place to start a conversation about how your fears don't have to limit you because you also have hopes and dreams and they can be part of helping you realize those hopes and dreams it's just, instead of just dealing with those fears. And so I, I think that's a great place to start, but the biggest part is gonna be having conversation. You know, yeah. ask them to sit down and to, to, to express, like we're still talking about, them, some of those things that they don't say out loud, out loud, so then you can actually right. talk about them. Uh, but I think that's a great place to start. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Thank you. That helps a lot. I'm glad Thank to hear you, Hassan. Thanks. And thank you, Julia. We have one more raised hand. We have Amelia. Okay. Amelia will unmute you. Go ahead, Amelia. Oh, I didn't, I didn't have one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, what we'll do now is I'm going to move into what I call Hassan's rules. Uh, years ago, I had a group of young people that I was working with and we were, you know, kind of doing the regular stuff you do and in, in, in counseling and talking about things. And they, and, and one of them said, well, Mr. Mr. D, he's calling Mr. D, you know, well, what do you, what do you think? What, how do you, how'd you get through all those things? And, and over the years, I've started thinking about it and, and I've come up with these, these five rules I call Hassan's rules and I, and I share them. And so what I want to do is I'm going to share them with you and, and we're going to talk through them. But as we do, we're going to also be reflecting back to your bio poem because there'll be points in your bio poem where you've written down things about yourself that may help you think about the lesson or the rule that I'm talking about. Does that help? Does that work? So we're going to move into and get my cursor to work. Hassan's rules. Now, Hassan's rule number one is simply do something. And the first time I, I was working with a group, they said, do so. Well, everybody does something. Hassan, what do you mean do something? The hardest part for me about being unstuck when I was in very difficult times was being paralyzed by all of the stress that was on me. I, being paralyzed by the fear that I might fail, uh, being paralyzed by what people thought about me and who they told me I could be because of my challenges. And sometimes what I realized I would do is I would just shut down. And because sometimes we would rather uh, do nothing because if you do nothing, then it's not your fault, right? The whole world is just to blame for it. But so the rule do something is just about us taking action. One of the things I learned in alternative school was the very first time that I, I, I was on a sailboat, uh, the principal took us to a lake and I was, I was like, wow, you know, it's very cool. But we were on the boat and he said that we were going to put up the sails and we were going to sail across the lake. And you all live around lots of lakes, so maybe you understand this like I didn't. But when he threw up the sails, the, he, he said we were going to go this way, straight ahead. But as soon as the sails went up and the wind caught him, we started going in the opposite direction. So I said, no, you messed up. You know, you've taken us the wrong way. And, and he said, no, Hassan, the, the secret to sailing is 
first you have to capture the win, then you get to control it. So once you have momentum and energy, then you can make the boat go anywhere you want. But first you have to start moving with the current, with the flow. And so when I think of do something, that's sometimes, that's the thing. We just have to take an action. Sometimes it's asking our parents to sit down and have a talk with us, Julia. And that first choice to, to take an action means that other things can start to happen after. And sometimes it's going to talk to the teacher uh, instead of assuming that we know why they, they said something or did something, going and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. And, and, and can you help me? And can we talk about this? And so do something is literally us choosing to act on our own behalf instead of waiting for the world to act for us because the world will act for us, you know? There are people lined up to do something for us and, and think it's the best choice. The only way we make it our choice is if we step in and, and be a part of that interaction. And so maybe it's asking for help. Maybe it's seeking assistance. Maybe it's being brave enough to raise your hand in class when you think you have the answer, but you might not. But having the courage to take that first step because it might be that you do. And so do something really is about us refusing to sit still and let the world go past us and being an active participant. Uh, the quote at the bottom, all that is necessary for triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. We have too many examples of people who say, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to act, so it's not my fault. But, but not choosing is a choice, right? Uh, if we don't act, then we have decided to let other things happen for us instead of us making things happen. And so when I think about the bio poem, and you think about the hopes and the dreams that you wrote down, if you look back at the bio poem and you look at the line nine, the things you want people to say about you when you're gone, in order for those things to be your truth, you have to act, right? You can't wait for the world to come to you and make you that great. You have to choose and then every day take a little step forward and sometimes a little step backward because that's the way life is. But I think the hardest part is just in the starting. And, and I talk about my I, my, I didn't talk about my brothers this morning because we didn't have a lot of time. But one of the things that I share often is that I have, I have three amazing brothers. I mean, the most brilliant people I've ever met. I've shook hands with the president. I've testified before Congress on C-SPAN. I've performed in auditoriums with 5,000 people and sat in big boardrooms. And still, my brothers are three of the brightest people I've ever met but none of them are doing as well as they should be in the world. Two of them are actually serving life sentences in prison. And one of them is still living in my mother's house because there was a point when we were young when they were so afraid that they might fail that they thought doing nothing was better because if you don't try, then you can't fail. But if you don't try, you can't succeed either. And so this rule literally came out of the fights that I had with my brothers when we were growing up to do something, even if, we risk everything and we fail. We know we tried. And if we tried once, we can try again. But if you sit and, 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 and get so caught up in the fear that you're paralyzed, then you don't ever get closer to your dreams. And so do something became rule number one. Now, rule number two, uh, oh, well, I'll read the, uh, this is a poem that I found. I used to share with my students uh, called The Dilemma. And it's all about doing nothing. Uh, it says, to laugh is to risk appearing a fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out is to risk involvement. To expose your feelings is to risk rejection. To place your dreams before the crowd is to risk ridicule. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To go forward in the face of overwhelming odds is to risk failure. But risk must be taken because the greatest hazard of life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. You may avoid suffering or sorrow, but you cannot learn, feel, change, grow, or love. Chained by certitude, you are only a slave. Only the person who risks is free. And so that idea of taking a chance on the life that you want, because that is the only way 
to ensure the possibility, and remember, not the guarantee, but even the possibility of getting there is only assured if you start walking toward it, taking some chances and trying some new things. And so be courageous. And, and, and part of taking chances and doing something is part of that is reaching out. And I'm going to talk more about building relationships as a part of that. Rule number two is stop playing small. Now, playing small is that we've probably all seen it. Sometimes we'll be in a place or in a class and, and the teacher may ask a question or somebody in the meeting might ask and somebody has the answer, but they don't want to raise their hand because they don't want to, you know, they, they, they're, they, wanna, they don't want to be seen. One of the things that I decided early on that I was not going to be invisible, you know, they were going to lock me in coat rooms. They were going to put me in hallways. They were going to send me down the hall to the room with no windows. And they were going to always be trying to do that. And I could either just go along quietly or I could be as big as I could. And so I always tried to use my voice calmly if I could, sometimes not calmly if I had to, but to make sure that I was seen, to at least be, be present and let people know that I'm present, that I wasn't going to just let them uh, make that choice for me. Stop playing small is the, is the idea of shrinking so that other people uh, don't have to work hard. When I was in school, it was a thing that we saw lots of young women do in math and science because some teachers said, well, you know, boys don't like smart girls, which I think is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But, but there, were, there, were, there, were, there were the young women who were like brilliant who stopped asking questions because all of a sudden they thought that that was important. Right, so playing small so that other people don't have to work. Making yourself smaller and your thoughts smaller so other people don't have to, to challenge themselves to be around you. I always say that that is the, the biggest disservice we can do. And so I want you to be big. I want you to be bold. I'm, I'm asking you to, to tell the world what you want and refuse to accept anything less than that. That's when you play big. That's when you believe you actually have a right to things in the world, not just somebody making exceptions for you. And because then very often, you know, and this is, this is us being frank, you know, I was told lots of times in my life that I should just be happy they let me stay in the room. I should just be happy that I got to, you know, to go on the trip. I shouldn't be making so much noise because, you know, somebody gave me permission to be there. And one of the things I finally started saying to people is no one gives me permission. Right. No one gives. It's like that Dirty Dancing movie. Nobody puts baby in the corner. You know, some of y'all don't know that reference, but go watch that movie. But 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 and so when I say stop playing small, there was a point where I finally had to say and my mother was a really big part of helping me understand that, that I'm I'm not going to be in any room because somebody gave me permission. I worked hard to get there. You work hard to get there. You work hard to overcome challenges in your life, to be present and to, and to be brilliant. And, and actually, I, I got a poem. Marianne Williamson, who some of you might know because she actually ran for president this year, which I thought was amazing. I mean, I've been reading her stuff for years. And one day she just showed up on my TV. I was like, this is so cool. She would be an amazing president. But everybody didn't agree with me, of course. But, but her poems are amazing. So I'm going to share this poem that I think speaks to this rule better than anything I've ever seen. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't, have, won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. What I love about this piece is, is that it, it, it says very clearly, and I think it's true, 
how powerful it is when we show up because you're not fighting just for yourself. Every day as an advocate, every day as a young champion, making your way in the world and making successes, there are other young people watching you saying, wow, did you see the way she did that? Maybe I could do that too. Did you see the way he answered that question and, and, and took care of that thing? Maybe I could do that too. And so where it says, as you liberate yourself, you unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. One of the reasons that I got into this work and in this part especially is because I realized that having gone through all those things, if other people who are going through those types of things could see it and could see the possibility of it, then maybe the next morning they get up a little more hopeful too, right? And so when you stop playing small, it doesn't just benefit you. It benefits everyone around you who gets to gain from your amazing finally showing and shining bright. And that's the gift that we have to be given to the world. So rule number two is stop playing small. Rule number three, change your friends or change your friends. First time I wrote that, one of my students says, Mr. D, you wrote that twice. I said, well, yeah, I know. He says, well, we know you're dyslexic, so sometimes you probably mess stuff up like that. I was like, that's not funny. But anyway, <laughs> I actually meant to write it twice because I mean it change your friends or change your friends. When you break that apart, one of the hardest things that we do is build new relationships, partnerships, and allies. Going out and finding people that believe and can support the dreams that we have. We have lots of people around us. We have people that love us friends and family who are important to our lives. And I'm not saying, it, it, the rule doesn't say get rid of your friends. It says change your friends. And so what it means is either change the people in your life and help them see the way you see the things that you're trying to get to in a way that they can understand and help you or find people to add to your life who can support and help you reach those dreams. You deserve to be surrounded by people that believe like you believe, that there are things that you can accomplish in the world and wanna help you get there. I talk about my brothers and I'll talk about them again because this is one of the things that really changed for us. I grew up surviving and making lots of hard choices on the street, keeping my brothers alive and making sure that we were safe. And there was a point where I refused to play small and I knew I had to do something different. And that's when I said, you know, I'm gonna to go to college. And lots of people that we knew were like, dude, you can't even spell college. How are you going to get there? You know, and they were always talking about the things that I didn't do great. Um, but my brothers always supported me. But the idea was that we were all going to go to college. It didn't work out like that. But I knew that staying the person that I was in that small group, some who loved me but didn't believe in me doing something other than what I'd already done, I was going to have to find new allies and new friends. So when I finally went off to college, to this place that everybody looked different than me, everybody spoke different than me, but I had to find new allies. And so I started making friends with people that were totally different than me in every way you could imagine, in their experiences, in the color of their skin, in the way they talked, in where they lived. Uh, and what I realized is because they had the same ideas as me, wanting to be great, wanting to break out of those chains and try new things, we were able to create new relationships. I still had the people that I love over here, but they couldn't see me any different than I was already. And so I need to find people that were going to see me different and willing to help me become that different. And so when I say change your friends or change your friends, I mean, you have a right to have allies and champions and, and people around you that believe in your greatness, that believe that you have the ability to go and do great things and are willing to help you navigate making that your truth. And there are gonna be people who you love and who love you who still can't imagine you that because they've always seen you dealing with things a certain way and maybe they just can't even see and imagine you as a fully realized adult independent. And so, you know, there's some fear in their heart that makes it hard for them to believe that you're ready to go another direction, you know, and that's okay that, you know, they have to come in their own journey. 
but you still have a right to have other people. And, and that's what we have to go seeking. And part of do something, right? Go looking for allies, not waiting. They're not gonna come knock on your door. You know, Michael Jordan didn't sit around waiting for somebody to go, hey, Mike, you wanna play a pickup game of basketball? He went out there looking for the challenge of basketball. And so I don't want you to wait around for the right people to give them come into your life. You can create those relationships. You start to, you know, go out and look for people and, and interview folks and, and, and go to agencies and say, hey, I'm looking for the person that's gonna help me get to the next level. Are you ready for that challenge? Right? And so when I say change your friends or change your friends, I mean really build out the connectionships and relation, the connections and relationships that are gonna help you thrive. Now, when I talk about friendship, sometimes I always say, uh, give me some definitions of what a good friend is. And, uh, you know, Wikipedia has lots of, uh, I just pulled a Wikipedia page, lots of ideas of what a friend is. But when I ask young people, the answer that comes up very often is a friend is someone who accepts you just the way you are. Any of y'all ever heard that? A friend accepts you just the way you are. And at first I was like, wow, that's a, such a nice definition of friendship. And then I thought about it. If you go to McDonald's with $5 through the drive through window and order a Happy Meal, the person that takes your money will accept you just the way you are. They won't, I mean, and so our friendships have to have a higher standard than the wall, the, 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 the McDonald's drive through person. Our friends ought to accept us the way we dream, the way we imagine. They ought to know enough about us to know where we're trying to go and, and start building the steps to help us get there. Another good example is my brothers. Although they didn't come with me, they didn't make that transition. One of the things that they did in one of the last encounters we had, we were young, is I went back home and I was gonna go out and hang out with them like we used to. And my brother Derek actually sat me down. And he says, you can't go out with us. And I was, I'm the oldest, so I was like, you can't tell me what to do. But he said, no, Hassan, we know that you have dreams. We know that you're planning to go to college, that you're, you've got all these amazing things going, and we wish we could go there with you, but we will not let you self-destruct. And that was, it hurt me a lot that my brothers told me that I could no longer go with them in those places. But at the same time, it made me realize how much they loved me, that they understood me and my dreams enough that they were willing to, to push me away to make sure they didn't catch me up in something else that would keep me from getting to it. And, and so your friends ought to know enough about you. They have high expectations for you that hopefully they can get with you, they can go there with you, but if not, they're still willing to push you there because they know that's the place that you're gonna thrive and grow and be amazing. And so when you think about the relationships in your life, they're gonna always be people at a whole range, but you should be seeking out and creating relationships and connections with people that are gonna help you become the person you imagine yourself to be. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm imagining everybody nodding their head, so <laughs> I got a great imagination. So I'm gonna move on to rule number, no, that's four, yeah. So rule number four is about forgiveness. Has anybody ever made a mistake uh, in their life? No, just me? Okay, a few people. Has anybody ever been able to go back in time and change that mistake so that it never happened and then come back and be done? No, I've not had anybody answer yes yet, but I've been waiting because if, if, if they do, I need to get a ride back because I got some things to fix. But here's the thing. There is nothing about what happened yesterday or any day before that that we can change. The only choices we have is to forgive ourselves for whatever happened those days so that we can move on with purpose in the next day or continue to relive those days over and over again. And when we relive those days over and over again, they become the thing that hinders us, that prevents us from actually getting to our greatness. One of the things that happened to me when I was graduating from law school is I, I went back home to visit and there was a guy from way back when we were kids and uh, he was like, Hassan, I heard you need a lawyer. And I was like, no, maybe you heard that I am a lawyer. And he was like, no, that's not it. I was like, but I, just, I mean, I just told you. He said, yeah, that, that's not it. And he started telling me about this lawyer that he could get me in touch with because 
because in his mind, the old Hassan from way back then is the only Hassan there will ever be. And he couldn't imagine me being somebody different. And the old Hassan in so many ways for me is a person that, that I have lots of pain with. I made lots of choices that I think were terrible choices, but I finally got to a point where I realized I can't go back and erase those choices, only make a commitment to make better choices. But there was a lot of time when I would look at myself in the mirror and say, Hassan, you don't deserve to be here because you used to be that other guy. You don't deserve a chance to, 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 to be a lawyer because you, know, you used to be that other guy. And until I could finally forgive myself, and it's not gotta be a big thing, but sometimes we have big things that we have to forgive ourselves for. But that gives our heart permission to focus on other things in our life because those things really do hold us down. And when I say forgive yourself, then forgive the world, there are lots of people out there that we can blame for things that happen to us. I have like a book full of names of people that I used to want to blame for all of my challenges. And what I realized is blaming them for those challenges never made my life better. Uh, even with my own father who left, who divorced my mom early and there was lots of family tension. And here's the thing, I look exactly like him. And so if, if I'm angry at him for the rest of my life, I'm angry at myself every day I look in the mirror. And so I finally had to forgive myself for my own choices and then I could forgive him because he's just a human being just like me. If you can forgive yourself for the moments when you weren't the strongest, weren't the best, weren't at your best as a human being, then you can give other people that same, that same acceptance because we really have to, to get good with ourselves before we can get good in the world. Y'all remember that movie, Lion King? I mean, I, I love that movie. I was so glad when I finally had boys so I could take them to, to see movies and people not look at me weird because he's the weird, why well, is that grown man in here crying the Lion King, you know? But I love the Lion King. And I, I love the, 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 the idea of, well, you remember Simba when he was young, he made a mistake and, and his, his father died, Mufasa died. And he thought it was his fault. And so Scar convinced him to run off and, and uh, hide. He wound up with that crazy meerkat and that pig, Timon and Pumbaa, right? Singing that song, Hakuna Matata, right? They were, they, were, they, were, they were cool. But he was a lion living a, a meerkat life, eating bugs and, and, and hanging out, not having his full power in the world, not living up to his potential because that guilt of that one choice changed everything about his possibilities. And so when he gets bigger and he's looking like a lion, but he's still eating bugs uh, with Timon and Pumbaa, he, he, met, he met Rafiki, that, that crazy monkey. And Rafiki was talking, he's like, you know, I know your father. He was like, oh yeah, my dad was great, but then he died and, and Rafiki hit him in the head with that stick, remember? And he's like, ow, why you hit with the stick? And he said, don't matter, it's in the past. See, there are things that happen and they happen so quick sometimes that you really can't do anything about them. And, and you just have to accept that they happened and you have to move on. But then he started talking again and they were talking really great. And he started, oh yeah, but then I got my dad killed and, moved. and Rafiki swung at him again. But the second time he ducked under the stick and he grabbed it from him. He said, give me that stick, stop hitting me in the head. See, the first time he wasn't ready for it. The second time he learned and realized that he had to do something different. So he reacted differently. But then in that conversation, he realized something that even if he had made terrible mistakes, they were his mistakes. And as long as he refused to own those mistakes and give himself permission to move on past them, he would never be a great king like his father. He would never be able to serve the world in his greatest potential. So once he forgave himself and he was willing to go back and deal with the hyenas and everybody else's judgment, even when he thought he had made a mistake and did something wrong, he chose to go back to own his power. And by doing that, forgiving himself, he finally got to a point where he could forgive Scar and he could move on to be the great leader he deserved to be. But the important part of that was he had to finally forgive himself. Before anything else changed in the world, he had to change. And when I think about this rule, that comes to mind very often. And if you think about that in your own life, if you can find ways to, 
understand the choices you've made in the places you've been and forgive yourself when they weren't great choices and give yourself permission to make better choices, then, then you have power. And then forgive the world. Forgive the teacher that didn't understand. Forgive the counselor that wasn't prepared to give you the right accommodations. Forgive the folk that made assumptions about you based on what they saw instead of what they heard and learned about you. Because if you can forgive them and let go of that, then you have more room in your heart to move forward. Because here's the thing, they still go on vacation whether you're upset with them or not, right? They still get paychecks and they still have, you know, barbecues. And so somebody told me, I read this quote, it said, you know, hating somebody like that is like you drinking poison wishing they would die. Every day, your life is a little worse and nothing happens to them. And so sometimes you have to just forgive completely with no reserve, just let it go. And once I could do that, I learned how to do that. It became much easier for me to, to claim the things that I wanted in the world. Uh, so it's much, so much easier to talk about the things that you want instead of the things that you don't want in life. And so forgiveness became a big part of that for me. And so as you think about your own experience, think about the things that you fear in your bio form, the things you don't believe or believe. And sometimes in those, we write down some of those things subtly when we go back and look at them, the things that have been holding us up in the world. And if we can start to unpack those and think about how we let those go, how we mend those bridges, sometimes how we go back, you know, I had to go back and apologize to a lot of people. And, and I could, I didn't, I, I just apologize. I didn't even ask them to forgive me because I didn't have a right to make them forgive me for the choices I made. I hurt people, but at least I could say, I, I, I cleared my conscience and decided to walk on. And some of those people did forgive me because I had the courage to come back and own the choices I made in the first place. And then it gave me the clarity to move on forward. So rule four is forgive yourself and forgive the world. Any questions so far? I know I'm, I'm just talking. I, I like to talk. I don't know if y'all noticed that. And so uh, I, I want to make sure that if there are questions, uh, pop a note in or send something in the thing. But I'm um, going to move on to rule five. OK, I see a question. OK, you're muted. Hi, it's Julia again. Julia? I had a, another question. OK. Would you have any, I know how you can forgive in your heart, but would you have any uh, YouTube video we can watch on how to truly forgive? Because there's some things my family has done and I'm not sure how exactly to fully do, do that. Thank you for that, Julia. And so I'll tell you, the first thing that comes to mind is Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E. B-R-O-W-N. She has some great uh, videos on, on forgiveness, on empathy, uh, on comparative suffering. So I, I think that you know, she is one of those folks that I, I like to listen to and I like to refer folks to, but I'm pretty sure that you would find, uh, if you look her up on YouTube, you'd find some, some very useful tools. And probably if you put in Brene Brown, forgiveness, Thank you. Uh, probably have other people that come up too, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So, Hassan, we have a question. Okay. A little while ago, um, this person would like to ask you, what advice does your mom still give you today? Wow. My mom gives me lots of great advice. Uh, in fact, I was telling Martha, I just drove down to Atlanta yesterday and picked her up and brought her back here to Kentucky to spend some time because uh, she's healing from hip surgery. And I just don't like the way Atlanta's dealing with this COVID-19 thing. And so I thought that her being in rural Kentucky was a much better, so, but she gives me, she gives me advice all the time. But the one thing that I think is the most clear and regular advice uh, is this thing she used to do when I was a kid was, you know, wow, it looks like you fell down and that really hurt. I'm like, yeah. And she would get me up and she dust me off. She says, okay, try again. And that's the thing that, that she did for me, sometimes physically, but always mentally. She was always telling me, okay, try again. You know, don't be afraid to do your best and fail. Because if you do your best and fail, you've at least got a mark that you can work with. And then you try again. 
every time that I failed out of school, you know, I was expelled from every school I've ever attended. And the last time I got expelled from college before I finally got it right and, 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 and everything went well, the day I got expelled, I finally, going back to that, that whole rule about friends, I finally started to believe my brothers So my younger brother, Sean, one time I came home to visit, and this is a side, but I, I came home because I lived at the alternative school. I was a, a residential student when I was in high school at the alternative school. And I came home to visit once, and my brother, Sean, had, he was sitting in the corner with these wires tied around his head, and he was speaking really low. And I said, who, who are you talking to? He said he was talking to his girlfriend. And I said, how are you talking to your girlfriend through wires tied around your head? And, and so I took it from him. Hello, I said, hello, somebody answered. He had built a telephone headset. Now you all aren't impressed because everybody's got Bluetooth, but this was 1983. He had taken a Walkman and a broken telephone and he had rebuilt them into a working telephone headset. It had a little thing on his hip where he could push the button. I mean, it was amazing high tech. And I was like, Sean, you could be one of those electric guys. Cause that's all we had. We didn't have computer guys yet. We had electric guys. And he just started laughing at me. And he said, no, man, this is just what I do when we're hanging out at the house, but nobody's gonna let me do this in the real world. And then he got really quiet. And he said, we don't get to be great in the real world. So those are the words that always echoed through my head. And I always said, you're wrong. I'm gonna live big, you know, I'm gonna, all my rules, right? I'm doing something, I'm not playing small. And the second time I got expelled from college, the only voice in my head was my brother saying, we don't get to be great in the real world. And for a second, I'm going to be honest, for a second, I said, okay, you're right. Maybe I'm, I've just been fooling myself. And I, I accepted that I was going to just have to go back and never get a chance to live my dreams. I went to my mailbox on campus and I opened it up and inside was a paper bag envelope. Inside that envelope was a, a bandana. And if you've ever seen... I don't have any, I always wore bandanas. The one picture you saw me on the, on the other side, I always wore band. that was my tag. But this bandana wrapped in plastic, it said, inevitable victory for Hassan with love mom. That was what's written on the outside. Inevitable victory for Hassan with love mom. That was the message that my mother always gave me. As long as you're willing to try, there's no way you lose. But you have to keep willing to get up. And so that day, even though it was my last chance, and I was like, okay, fine. I'm, that day I got up and I went and I said, I'll be back. And everyone laughed. And a year later, I came back. And a couple years later, I graduated president of student body, homecoming king, and all of those things. But it was because that advice my mother always gave me. It's time for you to, to show the world who you are. Everybody's got an opinion, she used to say. Everybody's got an opinion of who you are. You get to decide who's right. And that's the piece that I've been working on. And so the advice is that you don't give up. Um, oh, there's this great uh, quote that I use. You know, it's like wrestling an 800 pound alligator. When you wrestle an 800 pound alligator, you don't give up when you get tired. You give up when the gator get tired and the gator don't get tired. And so the thing that we have to do is we have to keep digging deep and looking for the energy to get back to what we're trying to get to because that's the most important thing. Martha, was there something else? You're muted, I'm sorry. Box, see if other folks were, and right now, no, but I'll, I'll okay. finger if it comes in again. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna move to rule number six. Rule number six is deserve victory. And this, it came to me once, I don't know if you've ever seen the posters that we had in World War II of Uncle Sam, I want you, you know, if everybody wants to join the military, but Great Britain had this poster of Winston Churchill, the prime minister, and their, their, their slogan was just this, deserve victory. And the first time I saw that poster, I was like, that's it. That's what I've been trying to tell people for years. Now it doesn't say be victorious. It doesn't say win every time. It says deserve to win. That's how we carry ourselves. Sometimes there are things outside of our control that keep us from reaching the ultimate goal. But if we carry ourselves in our attitude, in our thinking, in our heart, in a way that we know we ought to win, it makes it easier for us, even when we don't quite get there, to get up and try again.
During World War II, the Nazi war machine was trying to claim the whole world as, as, as its own domain. And Hitler and the, 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 the Nazi war machine rolled across Europe. And one of the things that they made, the promises they made across Europe was, you know, we share the same culture, our language is, is close to the same. We got, you know, if you join us in our, in our, in our idea of, of superiority and white supremacy, then you get to be a part of the team. You gotta just throw up the gang sign and, and speak the secret word. But if you join us, you get to keep everything. Your language, your art, your buildings, your churches that are a thousand years old, all of that is safe as long as you join. But if you don't, Hitler said, everything about you will be destroyed to the ground. It will be like you never existed in history. And so nation after nation accepted that. Many of them said that they didn't really want to, but they were trying to preserve what they thought were the important things. And so nation after nation rolled over under the Nazi war machine. When they got to Great Britain, that little island, Churchill said no. He said, every man, every woman, every child will stand and we will fight. And when we fight, we'll most likely die, but the whole world watching will know we deserve victory. Pound for pound, heart for heart, there's no way you could defeat us. But for more bombs, more planes, more trains, more guns, if it was a fair fight, there's no way. And that's the attitude that I want us to carry into the world. That every day we walk into our own existence knowing that we deserve to win, knowing we deserve the supports and the services to make sure that we can have our own impact on the world, that we can leave our own mark, and then we can be great in our own way. And when we know we deserve it, even when the system doesn't quite get it right, the next morning we can get up and we can step right back into it and we can try again because we know we are on the right path with the right momentum. And I think that's the attitude that has carried me in so many places is knowing that even when I failed, that I should have won. And if I try one more time, this might be the time that it finally works. And so deserving victory is really that capstone, but it really is all of the other pieces. If you think about the trajectory, first we have to take action and do something. Once we choose to act, we have to stop playing small and pretending we're not great in the world, demand to be seen and heard and recognized. Once we do that, we have to ally ourselves with the kind of friends and relationships that are going to make us stronger, make us more effective, and make it possible for us to really reach those high heights and deep depths. And once we find that, we have to finally forgive some of the things that didn't go quite as well. Ourselves and others, these systems that are meant to support us but don't always get it right. Because if we can put all those together, we know every day we're walking into places where we know we should win. We know we should have the support to prove what we can do in a classroom, in a work setting, in, in, in any environment that we choose to be a part of. And so they build on each other like building blocks. The bio poem is the tool that I use to extrapolate. It's the thing that I use when, I, when you break it down, those different pieces, uh, like four relationships you value, that becomes a way for you to look at the connections you have when you're thinking about changing your friends or changing your friends. If those connections are strong, supportive connections, and they're enough to keep you moving, then you're good. But if not, you need to add some people, you get to start adding. That's when you can start to figure out where you add. When you talk about stop playing small, think about the things that you hope and dream. Think about the legacy you want to leave when you say, when I'm gone, I want people to be able to say this about me. Because that sets a standard for you that then you can start to build toward when you're building relationships and you're taking action. And it's clear action. It's not just doing anything. It's doing something that moves you toward your dreams, your goals, and your hopes. And so all of those pieces together kind of give us the space to start to develop our voice, to decide what it is that we want to fight for and who we want to fight with, which I think is very important. And it gives you a way to, 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 to lay out a message and be very clear about your expectations. I love some of the questions that we got about how we build conversation so that we can engage people that may not see us the way we see ourselves, so that they can understand how we're, how we're showing up in the world and how they can help us show up in the world that way. And so all of these together uh, really, my brain caught ahead of me again, hold on. <laughs> really give us a chance to, to really 
move the needle for our own success, uh, for the things that we're trying to do. And when I say our own success, anytime we succeed, anytime you reach one of those milestones and you know you've done something, there's a whole group of folks that you get to celebrate with. And, and they ought to have a chance to see themselves in those victory dances because that's how we, we build community. Uh, anyone that tells you that they became successful on their own, there's two things I can tell you about them. First, they are a liar, period. And second, they are a fool because they weren't courageous enough to acknowledge all the other people that had to be there to support them and to back them up in order for them to be that great. We are at our best in community. We are in our best when we have allies and support and we can be support. And I think that's the thing that I used to forget because I was always the recipient of services, because I was always the client, I forgot sometimes that I could also be the advocate, that I could be the ally, that I could be the partner that helps somebody else become successful. Does that make sense? So we can be both, right? We can be you know, receiving, but, but this is a symbiotic relationship. We give and we take. We don't just take. We're not pariahs. We're not, we're, we're not leeches. We don't just take. We're giving too. And sometimes we forget our ability to acknowledge that when other people keep reminding us just what they have to give us to make sure that we can do what we want to do. And, and so I, I always want to be clear, and I hope that you try to be clear too, that you are nobody's charity case. You are nobody's... Uh, gift nobody gave you the opportunity or the chance you have worked just like i have worked hard to make the world see the amazing possibilities we have and you have a right to acknowledge those things and to be acknowledged for those things and at the same time accept the fact that there are other people around us that help to ensure that we get to these places see i'm about to go into a whole other lecture so let me take a deep breath um we are I think we got a little time for some questions. I think I might have seen Marcus' hand go up. I, I have one question and I okay. encourage folks to bring some more in because I know we have about, I think we have about 10 minutes left. Okay. About 10 minutes left. Um, one of the questions looks like, um, can you share some of what your mentors, some of your mentors and how they support and helped him? How did, how did your mentors help you? And, and for all of you on the call, again, we've got 10 minutes you're welcome to type the questions in the chat box and I'll either read them or I'll unmute you. Sure, mentors, I've had so many. And many of them uh, were subtle. I think that the, the best mentors, are, I didn't realize until years later, oh, that's what they were doing. Uh, you know, they're just the general reminders and, and folks who would show up. I had one mentor in college uh, and one of the challenges that I, I faced in college, of course, we didn't have all the digital age. And so I went to one professor and actually told him that I couldn't, you know, we had like five, 600 page books to read. I was like, oh, I don't know how I went up in this class, but I did. And so I, I, I went to him and I said, look, um, I'm completely engaged and I'm, I'm, I will be here every class period, given 100% of what I have, but it will be impossible for me to process all of those books in a, in a time and a way that's gonna make it useful. And the next week in class, he showed up with three boxes of cassette tapes. He had gone around the community and asked all of the retired professors and volunteers at the college to each read one of the books onto cassette tapes so that I could listen to those books before we had Audible and before we had all that technology so that I could listen to those books and engage. And so as a mentor, that was a pretty amazing moment for me, you know, recognizing that sometimes if we speak a need, even if we don't know how to solve the problem, if we can actually set it out loud, other people are willing to struggle with us to find a solution to it. Uh, but there was also Dr. Rain Wilson, the administrator at the alternative school, and she was always finding neat ways to, um, to keep me engaged. Uh, in fact, one day I remember in class, I got in, you know, I got in trouble a lot. I was about to say one day I got in trouble. This one day that I got in trouble, <laughs> um, I was sent to her office and I went there waiting to get the speech. You know, I was the kid that was always going to an office and, and eventually you get the speech. I'm just waiting for you to screw up bad enough for me to put you out of here and you're almost there. And so I sat there. Now, Dr. Rain Wilson was legally blind 
had these really thick glasses that magnified her eyes. And she walked very slow and deliberately because she had to know where everything was. And so I was sitting in her office waiting for her, kind of bouncing like I always do. And she came in very slow and she, and she sat down across from me and she just stared at me. And, um, and then she said, I know who you are. And I was like, ah, see, here we go. And she said, and I think that you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. And all you can do is prove me wrong. And I was like, what? And then I was like, oh, right, she can't see, right? She's nothing but shadow beyond two feet. And so I said, you know that it's Hassan, right, Lorraine? And she sat there for a second. And, and then she said, I know who you are. And I think that you can accomplish anything that you set your mind to. And all you can do, Hassan, is make me a fool for believing such great things about you. For the first time in my entire educational career, someone had the courage to tell me that I was already great. I didn't have to work for it. I didn't have to prove it or earn it. I was already great. Only thing I could do was lose being great by accepting something less than that. And that became a real challenge and charge for me. And she would always push me whenever she saw me to, to, to rise up to that expectation of me instead of lowering myself to the expectation the rest of the world had. Oh, you're not going to be anything. So why even worry? And so the mentors in my life always raised the bar high for me. And sometimes I'd be like, you know, that's too high. They were like, well, maybe you just need to practice jumping. Right? Maybe you just need you know, to figure out how to build stairs. But I'm not going to lower the bar. Your job is to figure out how you get over it. And I think that was probably one of the greatest gifts that most of my mentors had in common, is that they held a standard that was up here, just out of reach, but not so far that it seemed impossible, and gave me something I had to continue to fight for and reach for in order to become the person I wanted to be. Thank you, Hassan. I, I see a few more questions popping in. Uh, one is Amelia, and she'd like to speak, so I'm going to unmute her when she's done, and, and we'll move on to the next one. Hi, Amelia. Amelia. Hi. Um, so, um, it's, so, my question is, how can I share my story and be an inspiration to others like you, and, um, and what is the first step? What is a, the first step? Yeah. So, so I, I, I think that sharing your story is, some of it's just as easy as the courage that you took to share your bio poem. Uh, your willingness to, to, to just speak your truth in the way that you wanna do it is important. And if you're willing to do that uh, in front of other students maybe, uh, maybe if there's a, a group of students gathering and, and you want to do that, I think those types of things are a great way to start. Uh, I started speaking in just small groups and, you know, hoping that there might be young people like me who, who would say, oh, gosh, you know, that's kind of like me. Maybe I can. And so I think that's, that's really the, the biggest piece of it, uh, being willing to, 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 to get out there. And now with all this great technology, you know, you can... You can do a you can do a five minute speech on on a topic you know any topic you want and and do a five minute you know conversation on it and just post it somewhere and uh, you know my sons do that now now I'm amazed it's it's, it's some I'm gonna try doing I've not tried that yet because I'm still a little scared of the internet but uh, I'm that's one of the things that I'm gonna be trying here soon is doing more of just you know turning on my FaceTime live and saying hey guys. You know, things are going good, but I want to tell you what's going on with me. I had this, had this challenge today, and this is how I got through it. And, you know, this goes to show. If you don't give up, then there's always possibility. Right? Something as simple as that. And, and I think how you get started, the first step is just what we've been talking about, right? Go through the rules. Do something. Stop playing small. But it sounds like that's exactly what you're planning, right? I mean, you've got I – mean, I think it sounds like you've got a template, Right. You're deciding to do something. Once you make that decision, go big, be brave, right? People, somebody might tell you no, but people might tell you no all the time. There's this great quote I heard. It said, you lose 100% of the races you don't enter. Does that make sense? Right? You might lose the races when you do enter, 
but there's a chance, there's always a chance of winning if you get in it. There's never a chance of winning if you stay on the sideline going, gosh, I could really do that. And so I think just you thinking about it and the fact that you're thinking and considering what to do, being, being brave and maybe making a couple of videos or, or, or volunteering to speak at a, at a youth meeting or a student, a student group meeting, those are the places to start. And as you get your confidence, you can start looking for bigger places and, and asking people if there are other places you can speak. That's kind of how I started. And good luck. I think you're going to be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more question up on my screen and we only have about five minutes. So if anybody else has a burning question, put it on the chat or raise your hand. I'll read this question and then we'll have room for one more if anybody wants to jump in. So Hassan, can mm -hmm. you share a time when after you were successful that you were knocked down and what you did to pull yourself back up? Oh gosh, <laughs> that is a great question. And I think that I can, actually. Um, so I've, I've never been shy about letting people know that I've been knocked down a lot. But when I finally graduated from college, I mean, I was, I, I, I graduated from college, like I said, president of student body, homecoming king. I was a cheerleader. I mean, I was like a scary cheerleader, but I was a cheerleader. Um, I gave the opening prayer and welcome a graduation from the stage. Uh, so I, I, this was like my victory dance, you know, and I thought that, you know, the whole world was finally going to be amazing. And then I went to law school. And when I got to law school, everything changed. It was like they had no concept of, of supports and services or any of those things. And then they just told me no. And so literally I, I failed out. And they were trying to convince me to leave, uh, you know, that I didn't deserve to be there, that I didn't belong if I couldn't do it like all the normal students, you know, and, you know, and they were really emphasize that, you know, law school is for normal, you know, we don't make exceptions because everybody's exceptional, all that stuff. And so, and so I was really um, in a hard place because it was the first time that I, in a long time, that I thought that maybe, you know, maybe I couldn't do something that I set out to do. Um, but I, but I'll tell you what, what kept me from walking away uh, as I, I was embarrassed, you know, all, of course, everybody in law school was like four point, you know, nine GPA or, you know, they're the valedictorians and, you know, and I was just barely hanging on most of my educational career. And so for a second there, I, I thought I was being the imposter again. And, and, and I was, I, I thought I was going to leave, right? Because, you know, everybody was telling me, well, you know, you don't belong here. And that was really a hard time for me. But a lot of it, the, the thing that kept me there was I started thinking about my students and I've been working with these summer programs and all these young people that were like me. And I kept telling them Hassan's rules and, you know, and, and I kept saying, you know, if you walk away, Hassan, then then all the stuff that you're saying is a lie. And, and I'll be honest, the last persons, the last people I wanted to lie to were the young people that had trusted their dreams to me. And I, and I just said, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I am not gonna leave this place until I get this degree. And, and I fought them uh, they expelled me three, I mean, three different times I got expelled and they told me, you don't belong here, leave. And three times I said, I don't, I'm not leaving because I told, I told my, my students, right, that you don't play small. I told them that you, you know, that you, and, and so you are going to have to figure this out. And so really, because of my mentees, the young people that were in my life that I was hoping to inspire, like Amelia hopes to inspire one day, like you all, you know, I, I, I finally said, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be here and you all refuse to give me the support, but I'm not leaving because, because I have something bigger than me to fight for. And so that is the thing that actually got me up off the ground. Because I think that for a point I was like, you know, I've been getting beat up my whole life. Maybe I can just lay here for a couple rounds and tap out. Maybe it wouldn't be that bad. But, but when I start thinking about the young people that I wanted to be a role model for, 
that were being told every day, you don't belong here. And you know, I'm, we're not gonna accommodate you because we, we don't need you. That gave me the courage to, to get back up and, and to walk back in again. And, and it was embarrassing because everybody knew that I was that guy still getting kicked out. And I would say, all right, I'm back, you know, and, and, and you're gonna have to see me every day because one of the things that I'm not afraid of, because it's happened all the time, I'm not afraid of falling down. And I don't get embarrassed now when people look at me and go, gosh, look like you're on the ground because I know, because I don't know if you all read the, the, the program earlier, right? But I talked about resilience, the bounce, right? You don't really have resilience unless you've fallen down. You don't know how to bounce unless you've hit the ground. You know what that feels like. Then you know what it takes to get back up again. And I think that's the thing that really fired me up. And I hope that's what fires you up, the refusal to stay down because somebody else said you don't deserve to get up again. Sorry. I, I got no, no, that was great. I, I do want to let everyone know that we're, we're, oh, we are out of time on questions, but I, Hassan, I'd like to thank you so much for an excellent workshop. And it's been my pleasure to be with you It's been fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and we're going to just ask people to put in the chat, did you learn something today? Yes or no? I'll look in the chat and we'll report out. Oh, I'm, I'm getting quite a few yeses. Quite a few yeses. Thank you. I like the bio poem. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's great. I knew you would, definitely. The bio poem is great. Loved it. The quote, first you have to capture the wind, then you can't control it. So great feedback, Hassan. Really, thank you. Glad. And some people took lots of notes I'm seeing. That's great. So I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. And, and for some of the young people on our call, I just want to revisit a, a, something we talked about earlier. If you're looking to, to try to figure out where your voice can go and, and where you can maybe step into a leadership role, we do have the Youth Advocacy Council. And in the summer, we're going to be looking for recruiting more people. So you can reach out to me at Vermont Family Network. You can reach out to Voc Rehab, to your Voc Rehab counselors, or Nicole Jolly. But I, I just want to mention that I think some of you folks would might be interested. Um, also, we whenever we do these, we always have a survey when it's all done. And my it looks like they my email address has just popped up in the chat. We are going to send out a short survey and a follow up email. And if you complete the link on the survey, you can enter a drawing for a chance to win uh, one of two $25 gift cards. Um, so just wanna throw that out there. And I just want everyone to know that at Vermont Family Network, we are here to listen um, so help, and to help. So please contact us when you can, um, whenever we can be of service. And you know, I think because you know we've not been in offices, email's probably the best way, but we still have someone answering the phone at work and fielding calls. So we're here um, if you need any further assistance. And, and I would like to thank everybody. So thank you. And if, if I think we have one more slide or did we pass it already? There's the last slide. This one is how we can help you. And it gives our information um, on the, the telephone, the email. We also have a Facebook page. Um, and for families, we have a closed Facebook page um, that's private just for families. Um, so there's lots of ways to reach us and to, and to get help, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Hassan, and thank you for all of our participants who came in today. You all have been the highlight of my pandemic. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> highlight of mine too. Yes, thank you. And good luck. All good right. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone.